very much. Thank you for inviting me back. My, my third uh, time being with you. So I feel very honored about that. And Ros, amazing. You know, a really extraordinary, extraordinary talk. Um, wow. Marie, I was sitting next to Marie, and she said afterwards, so are you going to tell everybody about your remarkable adventure drinking a bottle of wine by yourself last night? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marie. I appreciate that. I would have told that story if it had been a solo adventure. <laughs> I had a chance to drink the whole bottle by myself, but... I had too much teamwork, actually. <laughs> Somebody drank at least half of that bottle, so it's really not a story worth telling. But um, I thought what I might do, because this is the third time I've been here, and the thing that I've appreciated, enjoyed, and respected so much about the other two times that I've come is it, it, how much there is a spirit of, of learning here, like proper, proper learning proper conversations that change things over the period of five days. Great talks and everything, but lots of space as well for the sorts of conversations that change things. And, um, and so because I've been twice before, I thought I'm going to try and do something different, which I hope you'll take as well as just being a mark of respect as well for the spirit of the learning that happens here. So I have put something together that I just haven't um, done before. And I'd like to start by sharing with you a little story of how I got to be here as well, because I think that in itself is, is quite interesting as well. I've just been given a coffee, by the way, um, an espresso. Um, <laughs> I must I'll just have a little sip. It's my first coffee of the day. It's very nice, actually. <laughs> I do think coffee is a delivery device for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> a spiritual thing to coffee. Actually, I do it before I write. I find on the writing voyage, it's one of the uh, one of the rituals that has to has to come in. Um, uh, so yes, just to to be here, I want to tell you a bit about that story, and I hope it will make sense. I hope you'll enjoy the story, and I hope you'll see that in a way it's on point. When I got the invitation to come, um, I knew I couldn't be here because I already had an engagement. And um, because I'd already booked tickets for Earth, Wind and Fire. <laughs> and if you like Earth, Wind and Fire, then you know that it's a non-negotiable after that. It's Earth, Wind and Fire and that is it. And that is what has to happen. And I've seen Earth, Wind and Fire many times through my life. They, you know, it's a spiritual thing for me. But I got the invitation in from an email, and um, uh, I have learned to trust an inner voice in my life. Nobody taught me to trust that voice. It's just something that I learned to trust over time. I was aware that that voice, after over time, was always there. I was aware I didn't listen to it. I was able to reflect on my life in such a way and see that there were times when, when I really listened to that voice, things went well. And when I didn't listen to that voice, I could look back on in hindsight and say, I didn't follow that voice. I got the email in from Christine saying, the invitation, would you like to come? And I just so well, my God, this is great, but of course not, because of earth, wind, and fire. Um, but I just tuned in, and that voice said, go to Wales. And what I find with inner guidance is, is, you know, if you don't like the inner guidance, you just give it another chance. So I said to that inner guidance, just in case you haven't checked my schedule, earth, wind, and fire, earth, wind, and, fire and Wales. And it was like, go to Wales, you know. So at that point, I, I, it was just obvious. I've got to go to Wales. I've got to give up my Earth, Wind and Fire tickets and um, come to Wales. It's a yes. And um, I was sad and I was really happy because it's just 
I've learned to trust that yes. I call it my sacred yes. It's a sacred yes. So um, I gave away my Earth, Wind and Fire tickets and said yes. And that was like on a Tuesday, I think it was. And then I was about to head out to New York and um, that weekend. And I just was grieving slightly that I wasn't going to Earth, Wind and Fire. <laughs> So I just, whilst I was getting ready for New York, I thought, I'm just going to see what's going on with Earth, Wind and Fire, because I'm there for a few days, and I could travel if they were nearby. Turns out that on Monday, the next Monday, they're in Madison Square Gardens. <laughs> so I'm thinking, all right, maybe this inner voice has got a plan for them, you know. And, um, but then I realized I've already booked to have a sensible meeting with somebody I don't know that night. And it's one of those sensible meetings. My editor actually had said, um, I think you should meet this person. And I don't do many meetings like that anymore, but it was my editor and, you know, I just thought, yeah, I'll do it then. So I'm going to have a dinner with somebody I've never met before on Monday the 18th of April. And I don't even know who they are, uh, but you know, Earth, Wind and Fire, I've discovered, are now playing at Madison Square Gardens. So, essentially, what happened was, um, I crafted my email to this person who I've never met before, and basically said something like this, as you can see, due to unforeseen circumstances, you know, so just, you know, basically, a lie. <laughs> It wasn't true. It just didn't tell the truth, you know. And I, I thought to myself, and it's nice. I mean, it was, you know, I've apologised a couple of times. I can see here, and I've offered to do Monday or tea or something with this person that I've never met before. But something told me to rewrite the email, so I rewrote the email, and um, this is what I wrote. I've just discovered something very important: <laughs> Earth, Wind, and Fire playing. Yeah, so I've told her what's happening, can we do lunch instead, or would you even like to come and see Earth, Wind and Fire? Yeah. P.S. This is eccentric, I know, but when you love a band, it's spiritual. <laughs> so, I send that email off, because I don't even know this person, but I've created a story, I've created a narrative in my head, that this is an incredibly important person. You know, and basically I should, should, should be doing all these things. I, I get an email back from her saying, Oh my God, I love Earth. <laughs> oh my God, um, can, I, can I come with a friend? I wrote back, Oh my God, I love that you love. <laughs> she writes back and says, I can get us meet and greet tickets for Earth, Wind and Fire, if you like, because my, my friend gets, you know, does this sort of thing. Oh my God. <laughs> so we get the uh, meet and greet tickets. <laughs> and, uh, so I also, I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you, I look part of the band, don't I? <laughs> So this is my two friends as well who came along who I'd never met before until this time and they loved Earth, Wind and Fire as well. And we had these ridiculous seats. I mean this is not, no zoo, we're there, this is happening, it's amazing. So things are going along pretty well, the concert's extraordinary, it's with Chicago as well, it's the band Chicago, so that's a great bonus. I mean, you know, I'm happy for them to have a bit of time on stage. <laughs> Basically, you know, we're here for Earth, Wind and Fire. Um, the two people who have got the meet and greet tickets, who have got us there seated for these, you know, in the fourth row, said, look, Robert, really, really sorry, but we're going to have to leave before the encore. So, I don't, I've never met people who leave before the encore. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but they left, and I'm on my own, and I'm dancing to Earth, Wind and Fire. But, there are these four girls behind me. And I've already said hello to them at the beginning of the concert, and I know they're incredibly cool, because they sort of look like the Supremes or something. 
And when my two friends leave, I'll show you a picture of what they look like. So this is the four girls, and they were behind me. But I'm looking at Earth, Wind and Fire. The two people have now left. I'm on my own, and this person here is Dina. She jumps over the seats and starts to dance with me during the encore to Earth, Wind and Fire. And it was a beautiful thing. Everything was just going great. I mean, it was a great night, actually. They began with Boogie Wonderland. They just kept <laughs> off with Boogie Wonderland, all right? They end with that. They start there. And then this goes crazy after that. Anyway, afterwards, you know, I turn around and I'm chatting to them all. And they very kindly said, they said that the highlight of the night was watching you dance to our band. And I said, well, thank you very much indeed. That's very kind, because I can't sit down when Earth, Wind and Fire are. And um, they asked me questions like, why did you have to hold on to your head so much? <laughs> and I said, well, it's, I said, it's just spiritual. The energy comes out of my head. I can't help it. It's just the way it is. And they were saying very, very kindly, it gave us such joy to watch you dance like this to our band. Anyway, I said, thank you very, very much. Um, by the way, how do you know um, the band? And it turns out that three of them are wives of the Earth Wind and Fire. <laughs> <laughs> and Dina's the girlfriend of another one. So they then said, you're with us, and you're now coming backstage. And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> Chicago, and then this was, um, that's Pat Matheny, and, um, and at one point, Vadim, uh, the bass player, he said, he said, meet Cool, and I said, oh, hi, Cool, and he obviously realised I was completely out of my depth, so he said, Cool, from Cool and the Gang, this is Cool, this is Cool and the Gang, but anyway, so all I want to say to you is, um, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, it really worked out that way, and I, I still don't really believe it happened to me, I've got to be honest, but I've got some photographic evidence. But also, it was also possible because of that email. And that's the one that I wrote second. You know, I wrote the safe one first, and then I wrote the honest one after that. And I think that's what I'm trying to do with my life right now. I'm trying to write the honest emails, if that makes sense. I'm trying to show up in a way that's more and more honest, because I just think that's ultimately, ultimately what we're meant to do. Um, I'm raising two children, uh, one nine and one five, and all I really want for them is to be themselves. That's it. I, I hope they never take a self-improvement program in their life ever. <laughs> because as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing there to be improved. It's just, I love them to be who they are. And that's a big part, I think, of my, I call it my work, but it's my thinking, really. And I can't help but feel that ultimately that's what leadership is. Leadership is this dare, fundamentally, for us to be more and more who we really are. I know it can look like it's about positions and titles and pay grades and things like that. And that's all very important and that's part of the job of leadership. But the real purpose of leadership for me is for us to be ourselves and to keep daring to find out even if you like what that uh, means. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to put something together through one of my projects um, Success Intelligence, a company that I created in 2000, um, which be it began as a talk, this, this particular project. It's my meditation, if you like, on success. Um, it's a meditation that's taken me all over the place. So this is just to be a very sort of brief idea of the leadership programs that I've done all, and just a small sample as well, quite honestly, but, but a wide sample, hospitals and 
BBC and the Body Shop and things like that. And um, yeah, it's, it's a broad sweep. I've also put in the um, England Football Association badge here to remind myself um, that not everything I do works. <laughs> it's quite important just to be honest about that, particularly on a day like today, um, you know, when we've all got to get back for the game. Um, but that's also true, I have to say. You know, um, a lot of these things I've done, some of them have worked quite well, and um, maybe they've been hit and miss, but I hope I can sort of share with you fundamentally this, this, this is the construct, four ideas. And um, these four ideas, these are four intelligences. And they're the framework for everything that I do. And they are the framework for how I try to live. The, the obvious intelligence in there is the IQ one. Um, I say that, I mean, it's obvious to me, that's, that's the one at school, and that's the one, to be really honest, I didn't do very well at, actually, at school. I was a C-grade student um, through school, I was reflecting on this with Howard earlier, that you know, school wasn't easy for me by any means. I, 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 at a young age, I needed a bit more why in order to deal with the what. Does that make sense? Um, reflecting on like spinning jennies and things like that. You learn about the spinning jenny, but why? What's the spinning jenny for, really? Why are we learning about you know, some of these things? What's it really for? These other intelligences are all part of something. This is something that I pulled together, but I, it, it exists in many, many traditions. In the tradition of yoga, there's a, an awareness that we have a physical intelligence. We have an emotional intelligence, and we do have this mental intelligence, and all of that creates something soulful. Steiner. Anybody familiar with the work of Rudolf Steiner as a man of interest? My children go to a Steiner school, and there, there's these, again, this is called, this is called will, this is called heart, and this is called head. At Steiner schools, um, the children don't learn to, to read or write until after six. So it's quite, quite slow. Um, in Finland, Sweden, countries like that, it's even later, nine, something like that. In Finland right now, which leads the academic tables in the world, they only do about three hours of academic lectures a day at school. So it's a, in just a bit of a different way of doing things. But um, for instance, when my daughter started to learn to write, she would like, take the letter C or something, and they would dance the letter. They would look for the letter in nature. They would draw it maybe halfway around the sun or halfway around the moon. And you, you get a feeling for these things rather than just trying to engage the head. There's also something called the fourth way, part of Gajif as well, which is this idea that to be a human being you have to, you have to be awake. And um, if you really want to enjoy the show, if you really want to enjoy life, then try to be awake in all of these centers. To only be awake in our head is sort of to be roughly 25% engaged in your life. To cultivate this, cultivate that, and allow another intelligence to come through, that's the thing. And I think leadership is about trusting that you and I are swimming in intelligence. We are swimming in intelligence, and that intelligence is trying to guide us. The problem is, as Dave pointed out yesterday, we're also swimming in sociology. Sociology, for the most part, does <coughs> seem to govern our psychology. We think the way our culture thinks. We think the way our village thinks. We think the way our families think. That's great if it's going on OK. So we've got sociology and this intelligence. This intelligence that makes you say yes to things when you don't necessarily want to say yes to them. But you've got to do it. You know you've got to do it. For other people, I was thinking, was like you were saying about courage. You know, you, I think this is true, that what, 
what looks like courage to others, it actually might be defined differently by the person who's being courageous. It just looks like courage. And it's a bit like that with choice as well. When people make choices in their lives, you often, they'll often be told, you'll have had this experience in your life already, I'm sure, where people will have told you you've been brave making that choice. But you know inside it was a choiceless choice. You just had to do it. In a way, you almost wish you could be brave about it. It's not, but it's not even a brave thing. It's a choiceless choice. You're being guided to do it. Something is asking you to do this. That intelligence is intriguing. We'll never get our head around that intelligence. We may never ever be able to define it. Maybe we, I'm beginning to think maybe we shouldn't even try. But we can learn to appreciate it. We can learn to enjoy it. <coughs> At the beginning of the book on, on authentic success, which is what I'm going to draw upon for this, there's a, a poem by Rumi. And uh, if I may, I just want to share a little bit of this. Rumi is a Persian poet. And he said this, he said, There are two kinds of intelligence. One acquired as a child in school. Um, one acquired as a child in school mem memorizes facts and concepts from books and from what the teacher says, collecting information from the traditional sciences as well as from the new sciences. With such intelligence, you rise in the world. You get marked ahead or behind others in regard to your competence in retaining information. You stroll, with this sorry, you stroll with this intelligence in and out of fields of knowledge, always getting more marks on your preserving tablets. So we're collecting information the whole time, and that, he says, is one type of intelligence. But there is another kind of tablet, one already completed and preserved inside you. A spring overflowing its spring box, a freshness in the center of the chest, this other intelligence does not turn yellow or stagnate. It's fluid, and it doesn't move from outside to inside through the conduits of plumbing learning. This second knowledge is a fountainhead from within you, and it moves from within you moving out. That second intelligence, I hope somehow, is something that we can, I can sort of play with here. But that second intelligence is what I've witnessed here in my other summer, summer schools, where you have a big program, but there's space, lots of space to consider things that you already knew. Things that you already knew, and maybe in your own way are now you know, just becoming courageous enough to follow through on. I'm going to start with physical intelligence then, and let's try and give this a go. And I broke this down um, so that I would talk about physical intelligence in, in these three ways. And I'm, I'm going to start by saying physical intelligence. Physical intelligence is literally the, the wisdom <coughs> and the courage to know when to stop. Okay? Um, for many of us, we are living in a manic society. It's a society where we're being asked to do everything faster than ever before. It is a non-stop sort of society. Um, we are pursuing happiness faster than ever before. I, I run a happiness project, I've run it since 1994, where we collate research on happiness. Happiness um, levels have not increased in the last 50 years. So we, and this is in Western countries, so we are pursuing, chasing happiness faster than ever before, but the faster we run, the longer the race seems to get. Uh, we are chasing success um, faster than ever before. We're looking for love faster than ever before. These days we, we call it speed dating. Okay, we chased it, we did made the whole thing faster. But I think a lot of us can relate to this idea that we're, we're going faster and yet somehow more and more of us feel like we're almost behind on our own life. You'd think with all of this speed we'd be ahead of ourselves, if not at least up to speed. 
But actually, a lot of us feel still we're, like we're behind on our life. I, I had somebody who came to see me for some coaching. It was a couple of years ago now. It was an October time. And she said, I'm three days behind on my life. And in this coaching, I'd like to catch up with those three days. And that literally was what she said to me. That was how we began. It was very memorable. You never quite know where a coaching session's going to go. It's part of the fun of it. So um, I, I said, tell me more. And she said, well, at the beginning of the year, I was three days behind on my life. Now it's October, and I'm still three days behind on my life. I've been three days behind the whole year. And I could relate instantly. You know, I could relate. I'm going, yeah, yeah. I can feel that. So I asked her a bit more. I said, how long do you think this has been going on for? And she said, a long, long time. My whole life is going to happen soon, but not now. Yeah? <laughs> Nearly, but not yet. Not this now. You know, the next now. It's going to be another now. Anyway, she just kept talking about how far back this went. I, at one point, I said to her, maybe you were born three days too late. <laughs> <laughs> just as a little... Helpful bit of coaching. <laughs> Best I could come up with at the time. That was the time when I, my inner voice didn't say anything. So you have to fill in. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, so we don't really stop. When we do stop, like you've done, it's an amazing thing. And it's part of the art of coaching is encouraging a stop. So I'm going to show you a video. I'm going to go. Take us back to New York City for a moment, not to Madison Square Gardens, but quite close, quite close to Central Station. And here's a video. All right, thanks for coming out, everybody. Really excited that all you guys are here. We've got a uh, really exciting mission that we're going to be doing today. We're going to be freezing in place on cue at the exact set. We're going to hold that for five minutes, and then we're going to unfreeze, and then we're out. attention 
to this intelligence that travels with us the whole time. It, it's like without the stopping, life is just horizontal. And life is just essentially an arrow pointing forward. But the stopping is the vertical. It's somehow in the stopping we pay attention to ourselves. We pay attention to each other. As a coach, I interrupt people's busy schedules to be able to encourage them to stop. And then in the stopping, something wonderful happens. I imagine for you coming on summer camp, if you've already been on a summer camp, you already know how good they are. That said, it's an interruption. It's an interruption in your schedule. It's an interruption in your life. There will always be that other voice that says, let's skip this year because of how much we have to do. But when we stop, we tune in to something that was available to us the whole time that we wouldn't have witnessed if we were just being manic, essentially. That's physical intelligence, knowing when to stop, knowing when to encourage the team to stop. Another aspect of physical intelligence is, I'll go to this thing called the weather. Physical intelligence um, is, I think, about recognizing it's the Life is about how we show up. We bring into being a world that responds to how we are showing up. The world is because of the way we're being. So the weather is just a, a little tribute to a coaching session I had once with somebody who it was his first co it was his first leadership position, and he had asked for coaching. He had a feeling he wouldn't be able to do this on his own. And he was coaching a team of about 30 people and they were all in the same office. <clears throat> and in one of our coaching sessions he said, Robert, I've worked out that I am the weather in my office. And I thought that was such a great observation. I am the weather in my office. The way I show up determines what sort of weather there's going to be in the office today. And he said, he, his awareness was frightening for him. He actually found that a very frightening proposition for a couple of reasons. One, he was astonished that people gave him that sort of influence. He's just, I'm just me, he's saying. But nonetheless, when people take on leadership positions, this is what we do. We give them a certain influence and authority. We take a lead from them, how they're being. He was also uh, scared because um, he said, I'm not a morning person. And he said, this is very real for me. I'm not a morning person. And I'm aware that the way I walk in has an effect. You know? But it's always stayed with me, this idea that in a way, we are the weather in our office. Always for each other. And especially if we are in leadership positions. So physical intelligence is asking us just to consider, how am I showing up in my life? Where am I waiting for life to get better before I show up more fully? Where am I waiting for the leaders at the top to do the leadership program too, so that I'll commit to the leadership program I'm on? That type of a conversation. Because it's, it's an unfortunate thing, it's an annoying thing, I think, in many ways, but often you have to take a lead without an example. You have to draw upon that intelligence which just says, I'm going to be the person I want to be, and I'm going to be the weather. So that's one idea of physical intelligence. Another is something to do with aliveness. And uh, this is really tracking the idea, when do you feel most alive? <coughs> when do you feel most uh, alive in your life? Um, you can see I've got all the size slides are now, um, <laughs> but it's nice. Um, <laughs> um, so here I've called upon R.S. Thomas, who I did study at school and have continued to study since. And I love what he said here, it was not I who lived, but life that rather lived me. We're an expression of something. We're an expression of life. And to clock when we feel most alive is, I think, a brilliant thing. 
just to recognize that. When do I feel most alive? That aliveness is intelligent. I didn't recognize this as intelligence, by the way. I, I wasn't into this sort of thing. I didn't know about it. But I do remember reading something once, which I've got here, by Joseph Campbell. <coughs> Anybody come across Joseph Campbell, The Hero's Journey, and that type of good thing? This is, I love this man, I think he's amazing. And then I read this one day, he said, people say that what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. He said, I don't think that's what we're seeking at all. I think what we're seeking is an experience of aliveness. We just want to feel alive. And I remember reading that, and actually my first thought was, you've got a lot of things right, Joseph. Um, I'm a little surprised at you. I don't think this is right. I think we are into the meaning of life. But aliveness, is that really true? And then when I really, it wouldn't go away. And when I really thought about it, I think there is some great truth in here. We want to feel alive. And to track when we are at our most energized versus drained is an incredibly wise thing to do. To track when I feel most alive and to really follow that calling is a brave thing to do perhaps, but ultimately it's what we must do if we're going to be who we really are. When do I feel most alive? Just that. So the question for physical intelligence and leadership really is, how do I manage my energy? How do I show up the weather, my aliveness? But also, how do I manage the energy of the team? And for me, that's a beautiful question. Just every now and then to be, if you are in a leadership position, to watch your team and notice its energy patterns. This is something, as I say, I don't think we will have been taught necessarily at school. You may have had a teacher who taught you this, but I think generally speaking, physical intelligence was not on the curriculum. But we have to accept, I think, that in our manic society right now, most of us are, um, basically, from an energy point of view, we're close to exhaustion. And, um, in fact, one nutritionist has described mankind as a knackered ape. We are exhausted, and uh, we do whatever we can to get ourselves through the days these days. That exhaustion is telling us something. It's telling us that there is a better way to do what we do, and we have to find a way to be engaged to do it. And one way is to be able to think about when we are most alive, personally and as a team. When are we most energized, personally and as a team? When does my team need to, need to run fast? But when do I need to help my team move through the gears and even stop and even, this is going to sound illegal, do nothing. <laughs> do nothing. It's the capacity to do nothing that allows something to come. And this is one intelligence just to consider. So that's number one, physical intelligence. And then we move along to the EQ one, the emotional intelligence. The, the thing that was really coming around in, in the early 1990s and influenced me to create a company called Success Intelligence. And emotional intelligence is a brilliant, necessary conversation, particularly if we're going to talk about passion, purpose, perseverance. We can't just do it intellectually, we know that. We have to somehow um, engage the emotional intelligence. It's a big, big area to consider. Um, and uh, what I've done is I've just broke it down into sort of three areas. Heart, conversation, and uh, relationship. And um, if physical intelligence is about your relationship to your body, by the way, that's a big thing, to your body, um, if I may backtrack a moment, let me give you an example of what I mean by that with physical intelligence. I was coaching somebody who was in a leadership position, she's in a leadership position, she's a gung-ho leader. I've just started coaching her and she is uh, gung-ho, is my best description for her. Um, 
I asked her just to tell me about the last year because results haven't gone so well. And I, and I asked, in, I knew to ask from a physical intelligence, tell me about your health in the last year. And she said, almost without taking a breath or a pause, oh, I had shingles twice, but I'm over it now. Physical intelligence. The body, I believe, this is body psychotherapy. The body is your memo board. The body is physical, it's intelligent, it lets you know if you're in harmony with yourself, if you're in harmony with the world. It's asking you to love yourself, care for yourself, pay attention to yourself so that you can catch up with your life. Does that make sense? That's that intelligence. Back to EQ. This one is about your relationship to your heart. Physical intelligence, your relationship to your body. This one, very much about your relationship to your heart. This is the one that is asking you to have an ongoing dialogue with your heart, to have an ongoing dialogue really about love and fear. I think emotional intelligence is that, just love and fear. The capacity to know what you love, the capacity to be drawn by what you love, and fear, recognizing that this is a big old thing. You know, fear has a, you know, it's a major vote. It's a vote every day of our life, in most conversations in our life, love or fear. I'm in a meeting, physically, this meeting is dying on its feet. This is a terrible meeting. I, in fact, I'm wondering if anyone's even got a pulse in this meeting. It's one of those meetings. This is the longest meeting I've ever been in in my life. I'm not even sure if it's got an ending. I know Ross has traveled across the seas and done all of that, but this meeting right now, I'm telling you, this is longer voyage than anything I've ever been on. I'm not sure it's got an end, and, you know, and you're just dying. And then that voice says, say something. And I think that's your love voice. And then your fear voice says, good idea, but let me tell you about how careers work. <laughs> and off we go. And that's our conversation, isn't it? Like love and fear. It's like a conversation the whole time. And somehow we've got to let love have a say. It's got to have a say. We've got to be willing to dedicate our work to love. We've got to let love be the whole point of our work. What does that mean? I don't even know. But I do know that love is intelligent. And that if you listen to that voice for love, it will guide you. And it will support you. One of the greatest successes personally for me that happened from running Success Intelligence as a company uh, was that um, I ended up writing a book on love, which uh, was, I think, my voyage, to be really honest. I think that voyage, that book on love was a massive, massive voyage. And it took several years to do. It started with talks. My first talk on love, I was terrified. Um, I called it Love, Nausea, and the Wisdom to Know the Difference. <laughs> I was just so scared to give a talk on love, because the voice starts saying, well, who are you to do that? <coughs> then I gave the workshops, and then, you know, other things happened, and then eventually I wrote a book called Loveability. All the while, in the company, the profit column was going way, way down. I mean, properly way, way down. But I had to do this. I had to create this project on love because I just felt that, you know, I've been, I think I've been on a mission to, to create classes that I didn't have at school. The Happiness Project was a class on happiness. I never had one of those at school. Uh, I, the success, I'd have loved a class on success at school, a class on purpose at school. Imagine that. A class on purpose, that would have been amazing. A class on listening to your heart. So love, loveability was the class on love, and I was just determined to do it. Um, and it was, in a way, I think it, it was the greatest success personally that's come out of success intelligence. But the accountant the whole time was going, are you sure you really want to write this book on love? You know, and I said, I know it's irrational, but I feel alive when I write this book. 
because I'm learning all the time about what love really is. So anyway, um, and as it turns out now, strangely enough, um, I seem to make more um, income through giving talks on love than I do on, on uh, success. But I would never have known that would be the case. So this is heart stuff. And um, I think fundamentally what, what I said in there was, sorry I went past that a bit quick, is this idea that if your definition of success has little or no mention of love, get another definition. Because make sure your heart is fundamentally in your work. It's got to be there. Emotional intelligence wise, this is something that I love just to, to say, I would always want this to be included in EQ, which is that leaders are the hosts to the conversations that matter the most. That's our job if we are in a leadership position in our teams, it is to identify the conversations that need to happen. Most of us sort of know, I think, what those conversations are, but this is when the fear comes in. One of the ways we cover up the fear, by the way, is by being busy. Yeah, busyness is a great way of basically postponing the need to look at what needs to be looked at now. Physical intelligence is now, by the way. Like Dave again, start now, not, fu not just future, now. Um, we create meetings where the agenda is so packed, the thing we really want to talk about doesn't get the time. And if we do get a chance to talk about it, we're too tired by the end of the meeting to do it. Also, from a physical intelligence point of view, we probably set it up that there's no gap between this meeting and the next meeting that's starting in the other room now. Do you know what I mean? So there's no gap, there's no space, back-to-back -back meetings, no stopping, no openness for the idea to come in. But I love this idea. And um, my first business card, actually, when I eventually made one, was just called Conversationalist. And the conversationist idea was just to get into conversations that help us evolve. I think I've noticed in my life that there are certain conversations I've needed to happen, but I haven't done it because I haven't felt ready. <coughs> and then I can't help but notice my life looks a little bit like those very still waters that you encountered, where without the conversation there's like no wind somehow. It's like you're just in these very still waters. It's safe, but we're not getting anywhere in our life. And then after a while, that conversation, the one that you know you need to have, it has got to happen. And I think we do that for ourselves, but I think we also have to do that for each other as well. For our friends, um, and our, you know, our family, but also our teams as well. What's the conversation that my team most needs to have right now? If you go into any team with a, with a bit of a getting to know your hat on, you know, one of the questions I'll ask in confidence is, what's the elephant in the room? Yeah. I think I've got a picture of this. I like this one. Um, it's like, you know, what's the elephant in the room? And wherever you go in the world, everybody just answers the question. It's like, in my experience, anyway, I've never heard anybody say, well, we don't have one. It's just a human thing. There is an elephant in the room. And I'm not saying that we have to be like counterphobic and charge at elephants all day long. I'm just saying some of them need to be addressed. At some point, somebody has to be courageous enough to go for it. So conversations are vital. This is by Susan Scott. I love this. It's from a book called Fierce Conversations. While no single conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of a business, a career, a marriage, or a life, any single conversation can. That's cool. That's cool. That's the opportunity of conversations. And then the third idea was relationships and um, the importance of, of relationships and knowing that even though we often front up as individuals, it doesn't really work that way. And, um, you know, Ros, as you said, it's like it is a solo journey, and yet there's all that support, isn't there? And it's, it's, I think it's the same with books. You know, you put your name on the book, but you do know that you just got helped every step of the way from people sending you ideas and things. And, and it is, I think independence is basically a myth, to be really honest. I think there is a healthy independence where you can think for yourself, etc., etc. But 
the big successes in life, I think it's always a team effort. Um, thinking that you're going to be able to do it by yourself, I don't think really makes much sense. So um, I wonder if you recognize this. Um, this is the burger that's making world headlines at the moment. It's called the Holy Bail. And uh, the Holy Bail is the burger that is just selling out all around the world uh, right now. And there is this interesting conversation in the Welsh football team, like, is it a one-man team or not? And that's the sort of conversation that often happens, you know, in, in teams and in sport. And, um, and it could look like it's a one-man team. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully we understand that it can't really be that way. Um, a light may shine on somebody, but fundamentally it's the team ethic that fundamentally makes this work. And, um, and uh, I'd like to think people like Mr. Williams and one or two other people in the team appreciate the exceptional talent of this one person. But obviously that one person isn't a one-man team. Obviously there's this backbone running through that football team right now that allows that person to express themselves in an amazing way. Um, but this is the idea here of emotional intelligence. How do we combine that piece? And I thought it was very interesting what Dave said yesterday about silos. And I think it's true, we do like a, a level of independence, but the next level of success will always require another level of partnership. In the journey, we have to do the partnering. It's one of the hardest things, I think, to learn in leadership because often we get promoted into leadership positions because we're super independent. And we appear to be totally self-reliant, and so we get into these <coughs> positions, but then suddenly we realize that leadership <coughs> is about relationships, the results are in the relationships, and we're this independent person trying to do relationships. And it doesn't work. It's one of the things we have to really recalibrate on really fast, is that we need to be independent and interdependent. But we could look at that for our whole life and just say, where in my life right now could I be a little bit more interdependent? Where could I be a bit more open? Where could I let somebody help me? Independent people aren't very good at asking for help. And yet, you know, when we let ourselves be helped, and I, I classify myself as a, as a recovering independent person, you know, it's, and it, I learned it, by the way, it's learned as well. It's mine, and it was in my sociology, definitely. My, my dad was um, alcoholic and he lived homeless for the last 10 years of his life. I could never get him the help he needed. He was just too proud for the help. And every now and then I could get it, if I could encourage him to think that there was a social worker who needed something ticked off on a sheet, he'd say, all right, son, I'll, I'll do it for her. I'll go in for the shelter tonight. That's really fierce independence, isn't it? But I think I picked the baton up by myself and went really independent. So when I talk about these things, it, it's, it's you know, in, incredibly personal. Because I do think, at, say, at some point, we have to be willing to receive. We have to be willing to let ourselves be helped. We have to be willing to see it's a team game. It's a really team game life. And as a leader, we have to do things like this, where we get nourished and supported and fed, so we can go back out there and um, give it our best go. So that's that one. Um, that's the emotional intelligence. And then we move into IQ, the one that most of us know, you know something about. And, um, here, it all starts with the thinking piece, and when I created Success Intelligence, essentially this is the, the main reason for being for Success Intelligence, that I just think we're all working hard enough, so it's not now about effort, it is now about thinking things through, and uh, being willing to think different thoughts perhaps, allowing ourselves to think thoughts that we've never really had before, and I think that really leadership is about, um, you know, not just being busy, but really recognizing ultimately that thinking is a form of work. And it's so strange because in some cultures, you go to some workplaces, if people are caught thinking, it's like odd. 
I mean, really odd. And it's actually quite hard to do thinking anymore now with, with open spaces, actually. But this is quite a big thing. Anybody, have you come across a book called Quiet, as a matter of interest? The book on Quiet, which is it's an interesting, it's the revolution for introversion. And um, often, again, just uh, when we're looking at how do we manage the thinking of our teams, extroverts think by speaking. This is the general rule. Extroverts think by speaking. So you, you ask an extrovert, what do you think about this? And they probably should say, I don't know. But instead, they start speaking. Because they know once they speak, it will come. And the introvert thinks by not speaking. And then when we manage our meetings, we have to say, right, if I'm managing the thinking of my team, who here hasn't said something yet? The other side of that is if I know I'm an introvert, then I need to make sure that I help people out a little bit and let them know that I've got an idea that could save the team, you know, a little earlier than in the any other business meeting part, you know, part of the meeting. <laughs> uh, it would be good to, to talk about it then. The creativity bit. It is this idea, I think, that, um, that we allow ourselves to stop and think. There's an art to it, a real art to it. The fear is that if we stop and think, there won't be anything there. But it doesn't take much. R.S. Thomas said he'd stopped reading the Bible and was now only reading Wallace Stevens. And uh, Wallace Stevens was an insurance salesman who turned out to be a pretty good poet. And uh, he said, um, sometimes the truth depends upon taking a walk around a lake. Mm -hmm. I like that. Sometimes the truth depends upon taking a walk around a lake. Just pausing, taking that little stroll, getting in touch again with what we know to be true, and then resetting our course. We've done loads of brainstorming things over the years, and. After a while, we realized that the brainstorming stuff it didn't work very well in a lot of the meetings we were in. So we started to ask people, where do you get your best ideas from? And um, to this day, I can honestly say after years and years of doing this, nobody yet, it'll happen soon I'm sure, but right now nobody yet has said I get my best ideas in the boardroom. So we're, we're watching for that one, but they've never said the boardroom yet. It's always nature. It's always in conversation, it's always in the shower, it's always it's that sort of creativity. It's an awareness that we, all of us, see things differently. I wonder if you've seen this one. This was very much inspired by Dave putting up his piece yesterday, you know, about the, uh, the griller, the x-rays and the grillers, that we see things differently. So this is a perception exercise, and um, the idea is you've got to count the x, so have a little count, and what's really interesting about this is just that there are lots of ways to see this. So I'm telling you it's a perception exercise, you know, I'm not trying to make any trick out of it, it's just true, it's just what it is. And, um, but we will all have different answers, um, not all of us, but there will be different answers in the room. So for instance, how many of you would say that there are um, three F's in there, can we just see? Thank you. Okay, so a few of you. How many of you would say four Fs? More of you. How many of you would say five Fs? Some fives. So that's pretty cool. We've got three. How many of you would say six? A more, lot more sixes. Yeah, thank you. How many of you would say seven? Seven? More seven? Anything else that I've not mentioned? Oh, it's really, this would be brave. This is your love and fear. <laughs> All right. Say nine. Don't say no. <laughs> it's nearly the end of the camp. You've done well, you've made friends. <laughs> don't say no. Not now. I want to say no. No, just don't. Please don't say no. So, yeah, it's interesting though, isn't it? All those different, all those different answers in there. And um, there are six in the main body of text. And um, sometimes we've, we don't see the F in the odds. And then suddenly they just appear. Don't they? It's quite interesting. Suddenly they're just there. Sometimes I think seven is because of the F on top. Is that right? Yeah. So you're just thinking, it's a trick. He's trying to trick us. Uh, I wasn't. But that could be that could be seven. Remember one time I actually run a program called Creative Leadership, and um, 
one time it sort of backfired a bit. There was somebody in the room who I said, any other answers? And he said, 21. Just that, just 21. Great. <laughs> How did you get 21? And he very, very quickly, I mean really quickly, superimposed the F onto the E's, the R's, the B's, and everything else in there. Bit too creative. <laughs> thank you for that, but no more interventions from you. Thank you very much. It's too creative. It's not the creativity we're looking for. Um, and uh, or how about this one? This is a fun one. Have you seen this one? This is great. Uh, this is um, where you have to spot the arrow in FedEx. Um, and because uh, some people know about the arrow and some people don't. When you know about the arrow, you just see the arrow. But if you've never seen the arrow, it takes you a while. And you go, yeah, yeah, there's an arrow in there. I can see it now. And then there's some of us are going, I can't see the arrow. <laughs> if he asks who can't see the arrow, don't put your hand up. Don't put your hand up. It's nearly the end of summer school. Don't worry, you make friends, remember. Don't do that. But it's an odd thing, isn't it? If you, if you suddenly can see the arrow pointing this way uh, in the E and the X, and you see the arrow pointing this way, can you, does, does that make sense to so those of you who didn't? How many of you can see it now who haven't seen it before? That's quite a nice way of doing it. Cool. It's there, isn't it? It's there. Suddenly, it's so obvious that it's there. And I think that's really like, to me, that's what the mind's a bit like. You know, the next idea is always here. It's just, are we here? Or are we so manic, busy, and hyper that we can't see it and we can't let it arrive? The arrow's here. The idea's here. The mind is full. The answer to this situation is right here. Am I here? Am I receptive? Or am I just thinking the old thoughts so that I can't see that it's here? It's here. We're swimming in intelligence. The idea must be here. And uh, so then there's always another way of, of seeing things. So I just threw the elephant in again for fun. But you just play with how the legs work and the shape of it all and everything else. It's just our perception. And I thought that was really interesting, you know, again what Dave said yesterday, that you, you, know, you won't see what you don't expect to see. It's a very cool thing to say. And I think it's absolutely true. So then the inspiration bit, which is interesting, is to do something with this, this, this thing of work ethic. We, most of us get brought up to believe that <coughs> success is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. And I think that's true, but only if you believe it. If you don't believe it, then um, it doesn't have to be <coughs> true. And, um, when I'm doing my sort of my keynotes on success intelligence around this, I try to make this point really that this is the this or these two statements that hard work is essential, but too much of it is tricky. Too much of it is 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 possibly the block. So what we have to do is we have to find a way to counteract. I think this. And here we are, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. Maybe life's so hard, maybe this job's so difficult, maybe this task's so challenging because we think that that's true. And then, this is a beautiful PowerPoint moment, by the way. I think it's now. I hope it's now. I built it up a bit. <laughs> but anyway, I'm hoping this is what happens. So watch this really carefully. You could miss it. Oh, yeah, I love it. I'll <laughs> 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 it again. <laughs> I actually made that for you. <laughs> Can you imagine how much fun I had with that one? Uh, listening to Earth, Wind and Fire in the background. The whole thing, you know, sing a song. And I'm doing that. Anyway, but I think that is a, a quite a cool thing. It's a proposition which, in real terms, says five minutes of thinking a day before you turn on your iPhone, your Blackberry phone, Black phone, rather, or whatever else you've got your computer, your email, five minutes of thinking. Yeah. Five minutes of thinking, what's important about today? I know I'm going to be busy and manic <coughs> and hyperactive, that's just the way the world is. What's important? What's real? What's true? That's what we're looking for. Five minutes. And honestly, I've got to tell you, in my coaching sessions, I never, hardly ever succeed at this at first. 
We have a coaching session. We say, right, five minutes a day from now on. Yep, I'm up for it. We get back. Second session, how did it go? I was an exceptional week. I just couldn't do it this week. Uh, if you'd have known about my week, you, you would understand those five minutes were impossible. And this is the territory. This is what we're dealing with. So finally, the last one, four intelligences into the spiritual intelligence one. Um, the one which almost brings everything together. The intelligence, we've been talking about the power, about that intelligence that doesn't have words. But it's there. And it's for us. And there's something about that here, that spiritual intelligence. The spirit of success. And these are the three ideas to have a little look at. And the first one is identity. And the power of identity is such a massive thing. Um, I've got a video for you. I think it might be coming up right now. Uh, let's see. The biggest game in Wales history in Lille tomorrow night. It could be just 90 minutes from the semi-finals of Euro 2016. Gareth Bale has been asked if they'll play as Belgium expect and part of the bus. <coughs> Belgium, they're obviously going to trying to think how we're going to play so they can set up, so um, yeah, obviously we're, we're used to teams maybe trying to set up in a different way or, or trying to predict the way we're going to play, but uh, we have our own game plan, we have our own identity and uh, we're going to come out and, and, and try and enjoy the game and, and try to play as good football as we can. Where do you get your motivation to play every game on the high level? The, the dragon on my ship, that's all I need. Goosebumps. Goosebumps. That's a physical intelligence response to something about identity. You know, and I love that. I, that's, you know, the number of times I've worked in organizations, especially more business organizations, where it's about the competition and what the competition's like. And it's just, I would say, but please, let's leave them alone for a bit. Let's think about who, who we are right now. Our identity. Who are we and who do we want to be? For me, it's, it's the crowning piece that makes everything else work. We think according to our identity. If you think of yourself as a victim, you think victim thoughts and you believe them. When you know you're not a victim, you have victim thoughts still because we're human, but you don't believe them quite as strongly as you would if you thought you were a victim. It's an identity thing. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful. So, identity works like this. The essence of leadership today is to make sure the organization knows itself. Who are we and what are we really trying to do? And the chances are we have stakeholders who are telling us who we are and what we need to do. And that's important. We pay attention to those people. They are, we're in relationship to them. But we also have the sorts of conversations where we remind each other what's real and important and true about what we do. And we have to hold on to that, that sense of the who am I and the who are we, and what is it that we are truly, truly about. That's where I think we get our honour from. That's where we get our courage from. That's where the love comes from, is us knowing um, who we really are. And anything that we can do to help an organization or a team do that is an amazing thing. This, for me, is a lovely example of identity. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant example. Somebody who, it's his passion to do lots of things. Um, but the whole time he realizes that this is about entertainment. That's the key thing with identity. And um, a, to me, a lovely example. But having those sorts of huddles where you do with your team every now and then and you just say to the world, we'll come back to you in a moment, but for now, we're going to try and remember why we do what we do. We're going to try and remember our, our values. And I actually believe that when you write down your values, I don't think you have to lose them. You lose them if you stick them away in a drawer. But if you say these values are going to be a conversation we're going to have, through the year, rather than just the start of the year, then you've got something that you can go with and you can move with. Um, the purpose bit. The purpose bit for me is fundamentally taking a business card and ripping up the business card that has these very strange 
titles on them, which tell us nothing about what we really do. I mean, they're extraordinary, really. And then you, instead of having a position on them, you put your purpose on them. And you, these are ones that have been given to me over the years. <laughs> and uh, I think this is fun. I really do. This is physical. We come alive when we start to do this. There's energy here. There's some emotion in it, which is a really cool thing. And uh, we start to play with possibility. And we start to talk about things. This is a, a CEO who changed his job title to mentor. Okay? Tired of being the CEO, I just want to help mentor. rather than the psychology of life. Very, very cool. So she went out to dinner and officially, unofficially resigned from her job as the dean, just in secret with her husband. And, uh, and now she's the chief creative officer. She's just getting the hang of it before she announces it to the rest of the faculty. But she's just playing with it right now. This was, uh, there was a front and a back to this one. <laughs> just got carried away. That's real. <laughs> this is somebody, a tennis player, who's uh, discovered that when you play better, your, your life works. And uh, you feel better about yourself. So then the last one there would be, like for you, just a thought. Purpose. That's really cool. Last one. Last idea is this idea that, that you know that the organisation can't grow if the leaders won't grow, and similarly um, for us, if we can't grow truly, um, you know, or our team can't grow if we don't grow. For several years, we ran a, a, a leadership program at, at Virgin, and a one-year program. And Richard Branson would kick it off, and he, with a question for the whole year, and the question was, "How am I still growing?" And every time we'd meet up, we would, we would begin the session, the first session, two-day sessions. The first session was always a reflection on how am I growing, but also how am I being asked to grow. And this growing thing is, is where I wanted to finish, because there's lots and lots of encouragement in the world to change and to improve yourself. And I am literally just off the top of the pile, I've just picked this as a little example of that pressure to change, to improve yourself, to become something that you currently are not. And this very much speaks to Dave's point yesterday, this thing of, there's a self out there that I'm meant to become. And uh, so here we, we've, we've got this lovely little piece, 325 ways to a gorgeous new you. I mean, it's so commonplace these days, we don't even balk at that anymore. But once upon a time, I think we would have looked at that and thought, that's a bit strange, 325 ways. <laughs> it's a monthly magazine. <laughs> you know, if it, if it keeps going at this rate, we're going to be having to work with at least 3,000 intended outcomes in a year on how we're going to be this person that we aren't at the moment. And it's a pressure. It really is. And, you know, these monthly magazines, like, 
you know, the next one is like, so for August, it's going to come out in the middle of July. That's how it works, isn't it? They don't come out in August. They come out two weeks early. So if you're going to get through 325, you've, you've fundamentally, you've got to commit properly, I think, realistically, to 15 or 20 changes per day. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. If you're taking it seriously, if you've got a subscription to this magazine and you're into this, you need to put, you need to diarise this. <laughs> you need to work through all of these ways that you can be a person that you're not right now. Okay, that's what this takes. And don't get other magazines because they've got other ideas. To <laughs> work, so stick with one magazine. That's what I would say. But also look on the other side. Look at this tired, stressed, depressed, blaming your hormones. I'm thinking, no, I'm freaking blaming you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blaming you for doing that. To me. <laughs> <laughs> Moses, 10. 10 is good. <laughs> Eightfold path, you know, Islam, five, five pillars. These are handable numbers. We can deal with these. That's ridiculous. And that's what it is. That's how it works. So here's the, 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 the sort of idea I'd love to share with you it is this. It's a big idea, but I think it's what I've been trying to talk about. We will often think there's something missing. Something uh, missing. Um, in our, in our life, something missing in this project we're working on, something missing in this team meeting, something missing in this conversation that's going on. Um, and every now and then, when we're really honest with ourselves, we'll, we'll see that what's missing is more of us, more of the real us. Not an us that we're hoping to become one day, an us that we already are, an us that's alive, that has a heart, that is intelligent and that knows a thing or two about the truth. And our job, I believe, is literally just to show up more and more as uh, the person that we truly, truly are. Because when we do that, I honestly think that's enough. And I think um, that's what this work is about. And I think it's the key, fundamentally, I think, to purpose, uh, passion, and perseverance. Thank you very much.